Dirty Deeds, Done Dirt Cheap. So goes the classic ACDC rock song. But throughout civilization, there have always been real men and women perfectly willing to do dirty deeds. But not so much dirt cheap. From witness intimidation to full-on assassinations of political and criminal enemies, hitmen have routinely been the go-to for getting a messy situation sorted out favorably. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Infographic Show. Today we're taking a look at some of the world's most notorious real-life hitmen. Bugsy Siegel Born into a family of poor Jewish immigrants, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel's criminal career began early with petty thefts as a teenager, culminating in a protection racket he ran along with his childhood friend, Mo Sedway, where they threatened to burn up pushcart owners' merchandise unless they paid the duo a dollar. Charged early with armed robbery, rape, and murder, Siegel began making a name for himself and he and Sedway formed their own gang, seeing a need for the Jewish kids to organize like the Italians and Irish had. Becoming involved in bootlegging during Prohibition, Bugsy also worked as the Bugs and Myers mob's hitman and was often hired out to other crime families. Siegel would go on to form Murder, Inc., a hitman for hire service utilized extensively by different warring factions to eliminate rivals. After a disagreement with the Fabrizio brothers, the duo tried to kill him, and in retaliation, Siegel murdered both. After the death of his brothers, Tony Fabrizio then wrote a memoir detailing Murder, Inc.'s national operations and gave it to an attorney. But the mob discovered his plans before Fabrizio could make the information public, and Siegel murdered him, avoiding suspicion by checking into a hospital and sneaking out. With many enemies and his hospital alibi in jeopardy, the East Coast mob sent Siegel to California. Once on the West Coast, he began setting up gambling rackets with LA family boss Jake Dragna. He also established a drug trade route from Mexico to the US, and it's thought Siegel was largely responsible for laying down the foundations for the massive drug trade we have today between South America and the US. A charismatic man, Siegel was nonetheless welcomed into the innermost Hollywood circles, and even considered acting himself, arranging for a screen test, striking up a relationship with Dorothy DeFrasso, the wife of an Italian count. Siegel traveled to Italy in 1938 and met Benito Mussolini, whom he tried to sell weapons to. On that same trip, he met Nazi leaders Hermann Göring and Josef Goebbels, whom he instantly despised and even offered to kill, but relented only after DeFrasso's desperate pleas not to. Imagine how different history may have been. After being implicated in the murder of a would-be informant by one of the co-killers, the newspapers began to reveal Siegel's past publicly, much to his dismay. They also took to calling him Bugsy in the press, which Benjamin Siegel hated as the term was slang for bugs, which meant crazy. Seeking to reinvent his image, Bugsy went into legitimate business with William R. Wilkerson by helping him finance the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas. It wasn't long though before the allure of running a legal front for mob gambling would prove too much for Siegel and his associates, and so Wilkerson was eventually coerced into selling all stakes in the Flamingo under threat of death. The Flamingo Hotel and Casino would now be fully mob-owned and operated. However, in a rush to open his casino, Siegel launched a disastrous opening with work half finished. Dreaming of hosting the biggest celebrities and luring big gamblers in with decadent luxury, the sound of construction and jackhammers were all that welcomed the few celebrity guests that showed up. The unfinished casino very quickly went into the red, but bailed out by mob money, Siegel was given a second chance. Finally reopening a year later in 1947, the casino began to turn a profit, but mob bosses above Siegel were tired of waiting. On the night of June, June 20, 1947, Siegel sat with an associate in a Beverly Hills home, reading the Los Angeles Times, when an unknown assailant shot him twice in the head and numerous times in the body with a 30 caliber M1 carbine. Theories on why he was killed differ, but most believe that Siegel was murdered because of his excessive spending and potential theft of mob money. As they say though, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Charles Harrelson most people know of beloved American actor Woody Harrelson, but have you ever heard of his estranged father Charles Harrelson, the real-life hitman? Born in 1938, Harrelson lived a relatively normal life, even working as an encyclopedia salesman and a professional gambler, but in 1960 he was convicted of armed robbery. It seems this would signal a change for Harrelson, who would go on to murder Alan Harryberg on the 28th of May 1968. Acquitted by a jury, Harrelson was then tried for the murder of Sam DeGale. Jr., where he was paid $2,000 or $14,000 in today's money for the job. 
His first trial ended with a deadlocked jury, but on his second trial in 1973, he was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in jail. Released after five years for good behavior, Harrelson was immediately hired to kill federal judge John H. Wood Jr. by a drug dealer. Wood hard-earned the nickname Maximum John for his harsh sentences for drug offenses and was scheduled to have the dealer who hired Harrelson to kill Wood appear before him on the day of his murder. Apprehended with the aid of an anonymous tip and a tape recording, Harrelson initially claimed he didn't kill Wood but simply took credit for it in order to secure payment. A jury was unmoved, however, and Harrelson was sentenced to two life terms. In 2003, the dealer who had hired Harrelson to murder Wood recanted previous statements and claimed that Harrelson had in fact not shot Wood. His son Woody tried to have his father's conviction overturned and secure a new trial, but was not successful. Harrelson would go on to die at the hands of the ultimate hitman man heart attack on July 2008. Interestingly, during an armed standoff with police as they attempted to arrest him for the murder of Judge Wood, Harrelson claimed to have killed both Wood and U.S. President John F. Kennedy, though he later claimed he was simply really high on cocaine. Kim Young-hee Everyone is familiar with the Marvel superhero Black Widow. Trained from childhood to be a deadly assassin, Black Widow was ripped from her family's arms and taught to be a master of weapons, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and all matter of spy techniques. Yet while the Black Widow is a piece of fiction, a real-life Black Widow was carefully groomed for years by the North Korean government. As a young pre-teen, Kim Young-hee saw a black sedan roll up to her school one day and party officials exit. After a brief conversation with her teachers, the officials informed Kim that she would be coming with them and that she had to go home and pack her belongings. She would be allowed one last night with her family before becoming property of the North Korean state. Leaving her family and childhood behind, Kim was taken to a remote and secret mountain spy school, Batman style, and given a new name. There, she was trained for eight years in martial arts, gunplay, spy techniques, and various languages. When South Korea was picked to host the Olympic Games in 1988, Kim Jong-il was determined to prevent it from happening, so he picked his new secret weapon to travel to the South and stoke fears of terrorism that would force the Olympic Committee to rethink their decision and scare foreigners away. Kim was teamed up with an older North Korean spy, Kim Sung il and the two disguised themselves as Japanese father and daughter tourists with fake passports. They boarded a South Korea jet to Baghdad and planted a bomb inside a transistor radio, setting it to blow nine hours later. Arriving in Abu Dhabi for a stopover, the pair disembarked, and as the plane turned back to Seoul, it exploded in midair, killing all 115 passengers on board. Realizing they were traveling on forged passports, the duo were arrested in Bahrain. As they were being searched, however, the two swallowed secret cyanide pills. Kim Sung-il died, but Kim hoon yi was later revived. Tried and sentenced to death in South Korea, yoon hee began to realize that she had been brainwashed about South Korea by the North. After thorough psychological examination, South Korea decided that yoon hee had been brainwashed as a child by North Korea and pardoned her. Today, she lives in hiding and under the protection of the South Korean intelligence service with a husband, a former South Korean intelligence agent, and two children, 56 years old and still fearful of retaliation from North Korea over her defection. Hitmen specialize in doing the dirty work that their organized crime or murderous regimes don't want to do themselves. However, unlike Hollywood movies, most hitmen aren't highly trained killers, merely thugs with a willingness to commit the violence the rest of us rise above. Also, like Hollywood movies, the vast majority of hitmen are taken down after their first killing, thanks to an extremely efficient criminal investigation system. And if the long arm of the law doesn't get them, hitmen are typically done in themselves by others they've angered or offended in their very short and violent careers. Who was the most prolific hitman of all time? What would history be like if Bugsy Siegel had really killed two of the most important Nazi figures? Also, be sure to check out our other video, The United States vs. The World. Who would win? Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.